Good afternoon, and welcome to the first in this semester's lecture series from the Research Group on Constitutional Studies. McGill's RGCS is an interdisciplinary research unit spanning political theory and political science, philosophy, and law, bringing together researchers working on questions about the fundamental organization, underlying values, and institutions of politics and political societies. The lecture series supported by a generous gift to McGill from the Aurea Foundation, aims to bring research on those questions into the heart of undergraduate and student intellectual life, making clear and available to students how much live work there is to do and there remains to be done at the intersection of disciplinary boundaries on questions about the values, institutions, and structures of free societies and governments. The next two events in the series this semester will be January 30th, when Scott Lemieux, a professor of political science at the College of St. Rose and a McGill alumnus, will give a lecture, What is Judicial Supremacy? And Do the U.S. and Canada Have It? That will be that Thursday at 4.30 p.m. in the Faculty Club. And April 3rd, when we will conclude the year's programming with a debate between Chandran Kukathas from the London School of Economics and Kit Wellman from Washington University of St. Louis on open borders and the right to immigrate. For today, it is my pleasure to welcome Ilya Soman, professor of law at George Mason University. Professor Soman holds an MA in government from Harvard and a JD from Yale. He is past editor of the Yale Journal of Regulation, the Yale Law Journal, and the Supreme Court Economic Review. He's the article of some dozens of scholarly articles, primarily centering on federalism, on questions of state-level economic regulation and takings, on judicial review and the power of the judiciary in the American constitutional system, and on the set of questions that he will be reaching today on voter ignorance, voter behavior, and democratic theory. He's the author of a book called The Stillborn Crusade, The Tragic Failure of Western Intervention in the Russian Civil War, and of the book from which today's talk will be primarily drawn, Democracy and Political Ignorance, newly released last year by Stanford University Press. Please join me in welcoming Professor Ilya Soman. I'd like to thank Jacob and all of you for having me here and for giving me the chance to escape the cold weather in Washington here in Montreal. Uh, je suis très heureux d'avoir cette opportunité à présenter uh, mon livre ici en Montréal. Uh, J'ai étudié le français à l'école, l'université, mais malheureusement j'ai oublié beaucoup de mots et de lois de grammaire uh, parce que je manque d'opportunité à parler français. Uh, mais uh, si vous préférez, je peux répondre aux questions en français si vous parlez lentement, mais maintenant je vais continuer en anglais. Uh, so I will in fact continue in English in part because I actually cannot get through the entire thing in French, uh, perhaps to the relief of some of you, but as I said, I can answer questions in French if you uh, want to. Uh, so uh, the main focus of my book and of today's presentation is on the problem that you see in this slide. This is Willow the Golden Retriever. She has with her an elephant and a donkey, the symbols of the Republican and the Democratic parties in the United States, and she needs to figure out which one to choose, and the question is, does she have enough information, enough knowledge to make an informed choice? Now, in the case of Willow, we actually can be pretty confident she does know a lot about politics and public policy, and she probably will make a well-informed choice, but I'm going to suggest that in the case of much of the American electorate, and also the electorate in many other countries, uh, the answer is much less optimistic. So, in this presentation, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about why the problem of political ignorance matters and why we should care about it. Uh, I'll then go on to talk about what is probably the, le the least controversial part of my book, uh, which is the extensive evidence that actual levels of political knowledge are, generally speaking, extremely low. Well. 
Uh, I'll also then explain why most of the ignorance that we observe is likely to be the result of rational behavior by individuals rather than a result of stupidity or lack of availability of information. Uh, some scholars argue, however, that even if the voters are ignorant to a large extent, we don't need to worry about it too much because they can make up for it through information shortcuts. I will contend that much of the time this actually is not true. Sometimes the shortcuts actually make things worse rather than make them better. Uh, some also argue that even if we do have a political knowledge problem, we can easily increase levels of political knowledge by various means, especially through education. Uh, in the book, I go through lots of possible ways that this might be done, but overall, I'm not actually very optimistic about any of them, uh, and I'll try to explain briefly why. Uh, in the last part of the presentation, uh, I will explain what I think actually can help at least reduce the problem of political ignorance and the extent to which it affects us, which is to make more of our decisions by voting with our feet and fewer at the ballot box. By voting with, I, with our feet, I mean uh, choosing where to live, for instance, in a federal system, but also making choices in the markets and civil society. When we make those kind of decisions, it will suggest on average people are better informed uh, than when they vote at the ballot box. Uh, and finally, of possible relevance to one of the next lectures in this series, I will talk about the implications of the arguments of the book for the institution of judicial review. Uh, so uh, some people would argue that maybe we don't need to worry very much about political ignorance, kind of like this person up on the screen. Uh, why? Because voting is an exercise of our individual freedom. And if we want to vote in a poorly informed way, that's just our choice. Similarly, there are many situations in life where we may have the right to make poorly informed decisions. For instance, I may have a bad diet because I don't know the basics of nutrition. Uh, I might choose not to exercise because I don't know that not doing so will shorten my life and is likely to make me sick and so forth. Uh, and so maybe voting is similar to that. Uh, it's also an example of where people have a right to engage in poorly informed decision making if they want to. Uh, I think John Stuart Mill did an effective job of refuting this kind of argument as applied to voting 150 years ago when he pointed out that voting is not purely an exercise of individual choice. Rather, as he put it, it is the exercise of power over others. When we vote out of ignorance, we don't just inflict that ignorance on ourselves. Uh, if the people we vote for get elected, uh, they will at inflict their policies on all the rest of society, and that makes it different from, say, me personally just eating a bad diet out of ignorance. This is putting the entire country on a bad diet, if you like, and therefore it's not purely an exercise uh, of individual freedom. In addition, in a democracy like the United States or Canada, public opinion does have a tremendous influence on government policy. It's certainly not the only thing that has an influence, but it does have a major effect. And if public opinion is poorly informed, then that may lead to bad policy and may, it may make it difficult or impossible for the voters to impose meaningful accountability on political leaders for the decisions that they make. Uh, moreover, even from the standpoint just of the desires of the voters themselves, even if you say whatever the voters want, they should be able to get, still, if they're poorly informed, uh, they might actually unknowingly vote for policies that uh, end up going against the goals that they hope to achieve uh, rather than advancing them. Rather than, say, achieving peace and prosperity, they might end up with policies to get unnecessary wars uh, or economic problems or other sorts of issues that, in reality, they had been hoping to avoid. Uh, so uh, I'll talk next about the extent of political ignorance, which is covered in chapter one of the book. Uh, there's a many, many examples that I could regale you with here. I'll just give you a few recent ones from the United States, and then I'll talk briefly about the situation in Canada, which is not actually in the book, but I thought it would be worth discussing here since we are, in fact, in Canada today. Uh, so there are many examples of voters being ignorant about a great many issues, including very prominent ones. As many of you may know, a major issue in American politics politics uh, over the last several years has been President Obama's health care bill, which was passed in 2010. Yet, as of August uh, uh, last year, polls showed that 44% of the public didn't even realize that Obamacare was still the law. 80% told pollsters that uh, they had heard little or nothing about the state-level insurance exchanges which are a very important and highly controversial part of the law. Uh, 
Uh, another uh, major issue of contention in American politics today, as also actually in a number of other democratic nations, is the future of the federal government budget, which is facing very serious fiscal problems. Yet polls repeatedly show that most of the public in the U.S. has very little understanding uh, of how the federal government actually spends its money. Uh, they greatly underestimate the proportions that are spent on major entitlement programs like Medicare and Social Security, which are in fact among the largest items in a federal budget. On the other hand, they overestimate five or tenfold or more the percentage that is spent on foreign aid, which is actually only about 1% of the federal budget. So the average voter implicitly has the view that if only we could get rid of foreign aid, our budget problems in the United States would be largely solved. Whatever you think of the U.S. foreign aid programs, that just isn't true. You could zero out foreign aid and the U.S. would have a, still a very serious fiscal problem. By the way, recent survey data shows almost exactly the same mistakes uh, by British voters and their understanding of the British government budget. So this particular one actually isn't uh, unique to the United States. Uh, in addition to ignorance about particular programs, uh, we also have ignorance about the basic structure of government. Uh, much of the public is confused about which officials or which levels of government are responsible for which issues. Uh, they're also confused about which issues political leaders actually can affect and which ones they cannot. This is something I'll talk a little bit more about later in the presentation. Uh, indeed, a 2006 Zogby poll found that only 42% of Americans can even name the three branches of the federal government, the executive, the legislative, uh, and the judicial. Uh, now, in hearing data like this, many people will actually blame you, the millennial generation, or at least some of you who are part of the millennial generation, if you're undergraduates, they'll say, well, this generation is the ignorant one. Instead of following politics like we used to back in our day, you're watching Miley Cyrus videos, surfing the internet, playing video games, and engaging in other useless, frivolous activities. Now, it may in fact be the case that that's what you are doing. I wouldn't know. I'm too old uh, to really understand the younger generation. Uh, however, it's worth pointing out that the problem of ignorance is not actually unique to the current day. Uh, for the United States, at least, we have data going back 60 or 70 years now, uh, and levels of political knowledge throughout all that time have been fairly roughly stable. So the problem of political ignorance is one that has been persistent over time rather than one that has just cropped up uh, in the most recent generation. However, the problem has gotten worse over time in two respects. One is education levels have risen enormously both in the United States and other Western nations, yet that hasn't led to a parallel rise in political knowledge. So in some ways, today's college graduates maybe have political knowledge levels similar to those of high school graduates uh, 50 years ago. In addition, uh, government has grown much larger and more complex uh, over the last 50 years. In the United States, government spending at all levels is some 40% of GDP, and that doesn't take into account many other government activities which are not directly on the government budget. Uh, so the same level of knowledge uh, is even more inadequate relative to a, more, a larger and more complicated government. Uh, and indeed, even if the voters paid more attention to politics than they do significantly more, they probably would only understand a relatively small fraction uh, of all of the things that government is doing. Uh, now, it's fair to ask at this point, especially given where we are, is this a problem unique to the United States or is it similar in other democracies? It's actually not easy to give a definitive answer to that question because cross-national comparisons of political knowledge are actually quite difficult to do. When you have differently structured political systems, such as, for instance, Canada's parliamentary system versus our presidential one, it's hard to match up political knowledge questions in one country with those in another. Uh, nonetheless, there is some comparative work on the United States and Canada uh, with respect to political knowledge. And what I would say about it is one can interpret it as saying that uh, political knowledge in both countries is about the same. Or one can potentially interpret it as saying that the situation in Canada is slightly better. Uh, so, for instance, uh, Henry Milner, right here actually in this town at, a, at the University of Montreal, has done some comparative studies. And uh, some of his data point in one direction on that question, some in the other. What I think is not easy to conclude from any of this data is that the situation in the U.S. as opposed to Canada is fundamentally different, that one country has just vastly higher levels of political knowledge than the other. And I think also the same is true of most 
most Western European nations for which we have political knowledge data, though comparisons between them and the United States are even more difficult to do than those between Canada and the U.S. So it may be the case that the problem of political ignorance is modestly worse in the U.S. than it is in uh, some other Western nations, especially since we do have a larger country and also a more complicated political system than some of the other countries do. Uh, but this is not a problem that's unique to any one country. Uh, it's one that seems to afflict modern democracy uh, more generally. Uh, so uh, at this point, uh, many people might react to this presentation by saying the problem must be that the information just isn't out there. Uh, I don't know if you, uh, any of you have ever seen the 1990s TV series, The X-Files, but their slogan was the truth is out there. So if only Agent Mulder and Agent Scully could discover the nefarious conspiracies that are going on and reveal them to the public, then the public would rise up, take action, and punish the evil conspiratorial politically that were uh, harming them in various ways. Uh, another possible explanation, maybe people are just stupid, uh, right? That that, and they can't understand basic political information uh, for that reason. Uh, I think neither one of these explanations, however, is likely to withstand close scrutiny. Uh, on the information not being out there, uh, I think this is just not very plausible, especially in the age of the internet, when more than ever, it's actually fairly easy to find at least basic political information about most issues just by surfing uh, through Google or through other relatively simple methods. Uh, and even in the age of print and broadcast media before the internet, there was actually a good deal of uh, relatively easy to obtain information available there, especially of the basic kind uh, that most voters seem not to know. Uh, similarly, it's not plausible to say that it's because people are stupid. It's certainly true that many people probably are stupid, but if you just look at IQ data, uh, IQ data in the US, uh, IQ scores in the United States and in the rest of the Western world have actually risen substantially uh, in the last 50 or 60 years. To the extent that we can measure our intelligence, uh, we're actually smarter now than our parents and grandparents were 50 or 60 years ago, but we have not used our intelligence, at least most of us, to acquire more political knowledge than they had. So the problem is not lack of intelligence, but rather that people are using their intelligence uh, for other kinds of purposes other than acquiring political information. Uh, and as I've about to suggest, uh, it's actually entirely rational for people to use that intelligence in that way to not pay very much attention to politics. Imagine that your only reason for acquiring political knowledge uh, is to acquire information to be a better voter. Uh, well, that turns out not to be much of an incentive at all uh, because the chance that your knowledge will actually make a difference in an election is infinitesimally small. In an American presidential election, the individual voter has a roughly 1 in 60 million chance uh, of having a decisive impact on the outcome. Uh, in, in other elections, or for that matter, in Canadian elections, the odds are somewhat better, but still extremely low. Uh, now, modest, obviously, most people don't know these exact odds, but they do have at least an intuitive sense that uh, the payoff to acquiring political knowledge uh, is, generally speaking, quite low. And therefore, they, in fact, for the most part, uh, invest very little effort in actually acquiring information and learning about it. Instead, quite understandably, they spend most of their time uh, learning information about other kinds of decisions where what they do is more likely to make a difference. Uh, now, it is certainly the case uh, that there are some people who acquire information about some subjects uh, despite the fact that their knowledge is unlikely to make a difference. A good example of that is sports fans. Uh, there are people who love following and watching their sport and they acquire a lot of information about it despite the fact that it's unlikely to make a difference. Uh, I hesitate somewhat to show this Boston Bruins slide here in Montreal. Uh, I won't remind you too much of how the Bruins have done much better than the Canadians over the last several years, uh, pretend as if I hadn't said that, uh, but here you have Bruins fans and they know probably that they can't make a out difference to the outcome of the game, but they enjoy learning about their favorite team and they also enjoy hating the team's rivals 
in this case, sad to say, the Canadians, uh, and therefore they learn much more about their favorite sport than perhaps they would want to learn if uh, they were only out to try to make a difference to the outcome. Uh, so just as there are sports fans, uh, we have political fans, uh, as I call them in the book, people who like to follow politics just as uh, other people like to follow sports. Uh, they enjoy cheering on their favorite political team or political ideology, their favorite candidates. They also, of course, many of them enjoy hating the opposition. Think of, say, Republicans who hate President Obama uh, or Democrats who hate the GOP in various ways. Uh, and I'm sure there are similar phenomena in Canada and other uh, democratic nations. Uh, so those people who are very interested in politics, i.e. the political fans, they do tend to be uh, the most informed voters. They have much higher levels of knowledge uh, than the average person. Uh, and uh, I think that's great in some ways, but there is this problem uh, that when you acquire knowledge primarily for the purpose of being a fan, that is often inimical to the objective of seeking the truth. Uh, think about the way that sports fans evaluate information that they get about their favorite team. Uh, if it seems like there's an ambiguous call by the referee in a game, if it goes against their team, they say, oh, it must be wrong. The guy must be blind or he must have been bribed to make that call. If it goes in favor of their team, well, it must be an obviously correct call. Uh, political fans evaluate information about their favorite political teams in much the same way. They tend to uh, overvalue almost any information that cuts in favor of their preferred position or their preferred party and undervalue any information that cuts against it. And there's a lot of experimental and other evidence to show this. Uh, one well-known study, for instance, uh, tested what would happen if you, during the 2004 election in the U.S., presented strongly committed partisan Republicans with information that weapons of mass destruction had not been found in Iraq, as President Bush had said they would be. Uh, most of these uh, test subjects to Republican partisans not only rejected the information that was presented to them, but many of them actually became even more convinced than they were before uh, that weapons of mass destruction actually had been found in Iraq, even though for the most part they had not. Uh, and there are similar studies which show similar biases among left of center voters. This is not unique uh, to conservatives uh, or to supporters of the Republican Party. Uh, in addition, those who are most interested in politics tend also to only talk about politics with other people who agree with them and only read about politics in media that have the same orientation as they do. So if you're a friend that's a conservative Republican in the United States, you will tend to watch Fox News, for example. If you're a liberal Democrat, it might be MSNBC or NPR, and obviously there are probably Canadian equivalents that you can Think about something like the National Post, for instance, is something that conservatives, uh, I would imagine, might read in Canada, whereas uh, more left-wing people would probably read more uh, liberal media. Uh, now, from the standpoint of seeking truth, this is highly irrational behavior. Uh, if your goal is to seek the truth, uh, then as John Stuart Mill famously pointed out, what you really want to do is make a special effort to seek out people and information sources that have different viewpoints than you do. They're the ones most likely to present you with arguments, evidence, analysis that you haven't heard before. If you're mostly just following media or talking to people who have the same view as you do, you're much less likely to get a complete picture of what's going on. But if your objective in acquiring political information, or for that matter, any kind of information, is not to seek out the truth, but rather to enhance your fan experience, to enjoy being with your fellow fans with the same side, uh, to reinforce your pre-existing views, to feel good about yourself, and so forth that actually this is highly rational. Hearing views opposed to your own often is painful and uncomfortable. On the other hand, hearing views that support them uh, often is satisfying, pleasing, uh, and makes you feel good about the commitments that you already have. Now, this is not to say that either political fans or sports fans deliberately end up believing things that they know not to be true. If you think about that, it's impossible. If you know that it's not true, then you probably can't actually believe it. Uh, but it does mean that when they seek out political information, uh, they don't make much of an effort or sometimes even no effort at all to try to do so in an unbiased or a fair way. Uh, controlling our biases is hard work, uh, at least from a psychological point of view. And much of the time, uh, when we process political information, we simply tend not to do it. Uh, now, you might say, 
this problem might not apply to people who don't have strong political or partisan commitments, swing voters who uh, don't particularly support either party or ideology. This is true to some extent, though they do have some biases of their own. The problem, however, is that swing voters are also the most ignorant. So maybe while they're less biased in their evaluation of the information that they have, uh, they also have a lot less information to begin with, uh, and therefore they uh, often make very poor choices uh, for that reason, though they less often make poor choices because they're highly biased towards one side uh, in the way that uh, committed political fans might be. Uh, now, uh, economist Brian Kaplan has actually labeled this phenomenon, which I call political fandom, rational irrationality. Uh, when you're seeking out information for purposes other than getting at the truth, it actually can be rational from the standpoint of your own objectives uh, to uh, do a poor job of being unbiased in your evaluation of the information that you obtain. Uh, so notice that rational behavior here is distinct from uh, logical, analytical reasoning that is unbiased, uh, sometimes actually irrational to engage in that, depending on what your objective is. Now, some scholars argue that we don't need to worry too much about political ignorance, even though perhaps there is a lot of it. Uh, voters, for the most part, can make up for it pretty well, they argue, because of information shortcuts. Uh, situations where they can use small bits of information to make up for the larger bodies of knowledge that they don't know. In chapter four of the book, uh, I go through many different information shortcuts. Here I only mention a few of the most prominent ones in the literature. Uh, one is opinion leaders. Uh, maybe I don't know uh, very much about politics myself, uh, but I can rely on the knowledge of other people who know more than I do. I can just let them help me decide who to vote for. Another possibility is maybe I can get knowledge from everyday life. Uh, I don't pay much attention to politics, but let's say I own a business, so if business is going badly, that's some sign that the economy overall maybe is doing badly, uh, and uh, if that's the case, then maybe the incumbent political leaders can be blamed for it. Uh, perhaps the shortcut that has the most support in the literature is this one, retrospective voting, uh, epitomized by this famous quote by Ronald Reagan during the 1980 U.S. presidential election. Uh, he said, if you want to know whether to vote for me or for the incumbent president than Jimmy Carter, all you really need to ask is, are you better off than you were four years ago uh, when the Carter had been elected? Uh, and of course, Reagan knew that the answer to that question for most people at the time was, that they thought that they were worse off. And so he said, uh, if you were better off, uh, then you should vote for the incumbent to reelect him, to reward him for his good policies. But if you feel you're worse off, you should vote against him, i.e. for Reagan himself, uh, so you can vote him out. Uh, the idea here uh, is that even if you don't know very much about the details of government policy, so long as you know whether things have improved or gotten worse under the watch of the current incumbents, uh, you can reward or punish them for their bad performance. If things have gotten better, uh, you can reward them. If things have gotten worse, you can vote to throw the bastards out, and then you can vote in a different set of bastards to replace them, uh, but the new set of bastards will have an incentive to follow good policies and improve the situation because they know that if they don't, if things continue to deteriorate, uh, they will probably be voted out in their turn. So uh, therefore, under this theory of retrospective voting, uh, maybe you actually don't need to know very much except just have a sense of whether things are getting better or getting worse uh, under the rule of the incumbent uh, administration. Uh, I think retrospective voting does actually sometimes work effectively, particularly in situations where there's a large, obvious problem that in some sense is clearly the fault of the incumbent political leaders. Uh, in those situations, uh, there is a real advantage of democracy over dictatorship in that uh, in a democracy, voters, even ignorant ones, will notice that and will vote to punish the incumbent political leaders uh, and get rid of them. Uh, however, retrospective voting also exemplifies Amplifies two major shortcuts, uh, or rather two major shortcomings that shortcuts have more generally. One is that you often need pre-existing information uh, to actually use the shortcut effectively. In the case of retrospective voting, you need to have some knowledge of uh, which 
uh, things going on in the world are actually ones that incumbent political leaders can have an effect on and which ones they can't. If you don't know that, then you will end up rewarding and punishing the incumbents for things that they didn't actually cause. And as it turns out, that's exactly what voters do a very high percentage of the time. Uh, both the United States and in many other countries, the biggest determinant of electoral outcomes most of the time is short-term economic conditions in the year or so right before the election. Yet, most economists will tell you that uh, political leaders uh, actually have only very limited ability to affect short-term economic conditions. If they could control them, uh, they would almost never be defeated for re-election because they would always find a way to pump up the economy right before uh, election time. But in reality, they have little ability to control it. This is particularly true for smaller nations that are often affected by broader trends in the world economy, but it's even true for larger nations uh, like the United States. This problem uh, is not limited to voting based on economic conditions. Uh, you see it applied to many other situations where voters reward and punish for things that incumbents didn't cause. Uh, for example, uh, I mentioned before uh, the case of sports fans. What well, turns out, at least in the United States, in local elections when uh, local sports teams have been doing well, uh, that actually increases the mayor's and other local officials' chances of re-election, even though in most cases uh, they didn't actually we do anything to cause the great victories by the Bruins, for example, which I had to mention uh, yet again. Uh, similarly, uh, in farm states in the U.S., in years when there is a drought and agricultural production uh, suffers a setback, the governor and some other incumbent officials are less likely to be reelected, even though obviously governors have no real ability to prevent droughts from occurring. It's even the case in coastal areas that if there is a spate of shark attacks, uh, that will as bad as bad news for local politicians. So so if Jaws surfaces and takes a bite out of some swimmers, uh, that's uh, going to hurt uh, politicians as well as the swimmers, even though most likely the politicians can't actually do very much uh, about Jaws and his depredations. And there are many other similar examples, some of which I go through in more detail in the book. Uh, there are similar uh, situations with some of these other shortcuts. For instance, take knowledge from everyday life. Yes, uh, your knowledge as a businessman or as an employee or as a student, or even as a professor perhaps, can sometimes be relevant. But you need to know something about the political system to know how to interpret it. You need to be able to have a sense of whether the fact that your business is doing badly really is a sign uh, that the uh, incumbent politicians are doing a bad job as opposed to that you yourself are doing a bad job in managing your business. Uh, in order to be able to choose between those two, uh, you may need to have some knowledge about economic policy uh, and the like. Uh, the second general shortcoming that shortcuts have is that while they may in some instances help offset rational ignorance, the lack of information that we have, uh, they don't do very much to offset rational or rationality, the way in which we do a poor job of evaluating the information that we do know. Shortcut theories implicitly assume uh, that voters choose their shortcuts for the purpose of seeking out the truth. But in reality, many times they choose shortcuts for other reasons, for instance, for political fan-related reasons. Think of the opinion leader shortcut that I mentioned earlier. Uh, if you're going to seek out opinion leaders based on their ability to improve the quality of your political decisions, what you would want to do is seek out those people who have the greatest knowledge of politics, those people who have the best track record of predicting the effects of past public policies. But if you actually look at who are the most popular opinion leaders, those who get the highest ratings for their TV shows or are most often read when they write articles, for the most part, it is not those who know the most about policy or those who have the best track record of predictions. It is rather people like Jon Stewart or Rush Wimbaugh in the United States, people whose primary skills are their ability to entertain and their ability to reinforce the pre-existing views uh, of their audience, mostly liberal in the case of Stewart, mostly conservative in Wimbaugh's case, and there are similar examples uh, in other countries. I'm not as closely familiar with them, but uh, they certainly do. Uh, exists. So it's clear people are choosing these opinion leaders in large part not because of their superior knowledge, but because of their superior skills in entertainment and their ability to uh, make you feel good about your pre-existing views uh, that you might have.
The same thing is also true with retrospective voting. Retrospective voting implicitly assumes that we use the facts out there in the world to evaluate the incumbent. So for instance, uh, you learn what's going on in the economy and then you use that to evaluate President Obama or Prime Minister Stephen Harper or some other incumbent political leader. But in reality, much of the time, what voters do is the exact opposite. Uh, they take what they think about the incumbent political leader and that tends to alter their view of the facts. So in the U.S., for instance, uh, when there is a Democrat in the White House, Republican voters tend to overestimate the rates of inflation and unemployment, and Democratic voters tend to have the opposite kind of bias. Now, it is true swing voters are less likely to have uh, this sort of bias, but they also, as I said before, generally have the lowest levels of knowledge to begin with, and so uh, they're not actually anything like fully saving us from the effects of this problem. Uh, the last type of information shortcut, if you will, that I'd like to briefly talk about is the miracle of aggregation, uh, so-called, which is not really a shortcut as such. Rather, it says maybe, it, maybe people don't have much information and maybe shortcuts don't vote. Uh, I'm sorry, maybe shortcuts don't work very well, but it doesn't really matter because potentially, even if you have 90% of the population that's extremely ignorant, so long as their mistakes offset each other, uh, the uh, actual decision will be made by the 10% who do know something significant about politics. So if you have, say, in the U.S., 45% who out of ignorance vote for the Democrats and 45% who out of ignorance vote for the Republicans, then the real decision uh, will be made by the 10% who know more. Uh, and therefore, uh, if you have these sort of mutually offsetting errors uh, that come about because of ignorance, then knowledge will ultimately win out. Uh, now, one observation that could be made about this theory is that even if it's true, uh, it's not actually very uh, flattering to democracy because what it effectively says is that the, the votes of 90% or more of the population uh, can safely be ignored. We can save some costs and time by not letting them vote in the first place and just having the 10% or the 5% or however, whatever percentage you think it is uh, do the actual voting. But even on its own terms, the theory turns out to in most cases to be false uh, because because it relies on assumptions uh, which don't hold up in the real world. The key assumption behind the theory is that ignorance-based errors are mutually offsetting, that is that they're random, but in reality on a wide range of issues they're not random at all. Studies repeatedly show that controlling for a lot of other variables such as race, gender, income, ideology, partisanship, and so forth, uh, knowledge actually does change people's opinions on a lot of issues. Uh, it is not the case that uh, its effects are random, uh, and this is, should not be at all surprising because uh, while on almost any issue you can make mistakes one way or also the other, uh, much of the time mistakes uh, in one direction are more intuitively plausible than mistakes in the other direction. Uh, so for example, uh, voters in the U.S. and in many other countries for decades or even probably centuries have overestimated the harms of international trade and underestimated the benefits despite the near consensus of economists the other way. That's because for most people, or particularly people who don't know basic economics, it's more intuitively plausible to believe that foreigners and their products are harming us in various ways than to believe that foreigners are benefiting us uh, for various psychological reasons. People have, many people at least, have an ingrained distrust of the foreign and uh, their opinions on international trade tend to reflect that. And there are many other issues where there are similar biases where uh, mistakes one way are more common than mistakes in uh, the other direction. Uh, a second problem with the theory of aggregation is that it implicitly assumes that all we really care about with respect to political knowledge is what kind of choice voters make between the choices that are actually available in an election. I call this in the book the binary choice fallacy. Uh, but in reality, political ignorance affects not just the decision we make as between the parties or candidates that are before us. Uh, it has a big effect on the choices that are presented to us in the first place because, of course, the parties and candidates, they know that much of the electorate is ignorant and they present generally a different platform, a different set of policies, sometimes probably even a different set of candidates than they would present with a more knowledgeable electorate. So it's not just that people might make the wrong choice as between the Democrats and the Republicans,
Uh, it's that the kind of options they have before them in the first place are often structured uh, in large part as a result of their ignorance. Uh, now, if shortcuts have big shortcomings and the miracle of aggregation is not as miraculous as its advocates claim, then maybe what we want to do, in fact, perhaps the most natural reaction is to say that what we want to do is try to increase political knowledge. And in chapter seven of the book, I go through many possible ways that we can do that, some very obvious and much discussed and some uh, less obvious here. Uh, I'm just going to talk about three of the most important ones to my mind and why why they probably won't solve the problem. Perhaps the most obvious way to increase political knowledge or so it would seem is through education. Uh, if voters don't know enough, why not simply mandate that political knowledge be taught in the public schools? If you don't attain a certain level of political knowledge, perhaps you won't get a high school diploma or there would be other kinds of measures taken to increase it. And this, of course, is one of the traditional rationales for public education going back at least a couple hundred years. Thomas Jefferson argued for this. John Stuart Mill did. Uh, many other uh, great uh, political leaders and democratic theorists. However, as it turns out, it's not nearly as easy to increase political knowledge for education as uh, people like Jefferson and his counterparts today uh, have imagined. Uh, as I noted earlier, it's very striking that over the last 50 to 60 years, education levels have risen enormously, but political knowledge net levels have been roughly flat. So it turns out more education doesn't necessarily equal more political knowledge. Uh, now, maybe the problem is that they're just teaching the wrong things. We could properly restructure the school curriculum and have it emphasize political knowledge rather than you know, the stuff that they might be teaching now, woodworking or whatever else might, they might be teaching in the public schools. Then we could use the schools to raise political knowledge. Uh, but there are two serious problems with this sort of approach. Uh, one is we have to ask what incentive do incumbent political leaders who control the schools actually have to use them to increase political knowledge. In reality, almost since the inception of public education, governments have tended to use it much more to indoctrinate students in the prevailing views that the government holds or that the majority holds than to try to promote political knowledge in any kind of neutral manner. In the United States, actually, one of the main reasons why public schooling was established in the first place place in the 19th century was to indoctrinate immigrants in what were then considered real American values, which most Americans at that time interpreted as Protestant values as opposed to those of mostly Catholic immigrants. In Western Europe, uh, public education was set up in considerable part to uh, indoctrinate people in nationalism so that people would have a strong sense of being Frenchmen or Germans, would support the government, and also, by the way, hate the government's uh, foreign and ethnic uh, enemies. So indoctrination seem to have been a bigger part of uh, public education, at least on uh, political issues, than uh, any kind of neutral effort to promote political information. Uh, and you might say, well, the voters can potentially force the politicians to use public education to uh, promote uh, more objective learning about politics and understanding of it. Uh, and in theory, that could be true. But if the voters were well informed enough to follow education policy in that way and had a good understanding of it, an electorate that well informed, we probably wouldn't have had a problem of political ignorance in the first place. So in this area, as in some others, political ignorance is actually a self-perpetuating sort of a problem. Political ignorance is itself, ironically, one of the major obstacles to alleviating political ignorance through public education. Another problem with trying to do this through education uh, is that even if the quality of political education in the schools was significantly improved, it would still be very hard to educate students to know enough about politics to keep track of all of the many issues covered by the modern state, especially since realistically they're going to leave school at the age of 17 or 18 uh, and in the next 50, 60, 70 years that they will be adults and voting, new issues are likely to come up. And unless you force them to go back and be re-educated every so often uh, over time, the usefulness of the knowledge that they learn will uh, necessarily deteriorate uh, over time. 
Uh, now, another conventional strategy proposed by many people uh, for uh, increasing political knowledge is reforming the media. Often when uh, pundits talk about political ignorance, they blame the media. The problem is that the media isn't giving us enough hard news. Instead, they're giving us a lot of fluff, entertainment news, lots of Miley Cyrus videos and other kinds of stuff that don't really, doesn't really inform people. If only they emphasize hard news more, uh, people would know more about politics. Uh, I think it's easy to blame the media, and certainly the media doesn't always do a good job of covering political issues. Uh, nobody could reasonably dispute that. At the same time, as I noted before, uh, information about politics, especially very basic information of the kind that many voters don't know, uh, is actually more widely available in the media than ever uh, before in human history. We now even have media such as C-SPAN in the United States, which is specially devoted to showing hard news in great detail, to showing unfiltered, uncensored presentations by policy experts, political leaders, and many others on all kinds of issues. There's also enormous resources on the internet that we can access and so forth. Uh, so the problem of political ignorance is not primarily one of lack of information in the media. Rather, it is a problem of demand rather than supply. Most of us, quite understandably, don't want to spend more than a small amount of time following hard news, either in the media uh, or in other venues. We actually prefer entertainment or prefer other kinds of uh, information that uh, we might consider more relevant to decisions uh, that will actually make a difference in our lives. So uh, even if the media were to cover hard news more often or present more of it, that doesn't mean that, that we would actually watch it and remember it. We might instead flip the channel to Miley Cyrus or to Boston Bruins or maybe even to Montreal Canadiens if they ever start playing well again. Uh, so uh, ultimately, I had to get that one in, sorry. Uh, so uh, be that as it may, uh, I think for the most part, while the media does make lots of mistakes in our coverage of politics, for the most part, the problem here is not one of supply by the media, uh, but one of demand. Uh, finally, uh, there is a solution which hasn't really been discussed in the literature, uh, but which I do discuss in my book. If the problem is that voters don't have enough incentive to learn about politics, why not just give them more incentives? Sort of a very simple economics 11 kind of solution. Why not pay them to learn about politics? Uh, say, set up a test. Uh, if you do well on the test, you get $1,000 or some amount of money, uh, and that might well increase people's political knowledge. Small scale experiments show that even relatively small financial rewards for getting political knowledge questions correct significantly increase the rate at which uh, voters get them correct. Not very surprising, but it's actually documented by uh, studies published in the American Political Science Review and other uh, distinguished academic journals. Uh, so in principle, I think this actually deserves a lot of consideration. Uh, if we really could do this, it would cost some money, but uh, it would be well worth it. Uh, the problem, however, is this. Can we actually trust the government, whether the American government or Canadian government or any other, to come up with an objective knowledge test we would then present to voters? Or would the government have strong incentives to skew that test in favor of its own supporters? Because remember that uh, they would have to both decide what questions go on the test and also what the correct answers are. And it's easy to see numerous possibilities for abuse here uh, because obviously a test that millions of people would take potentially would have the opportunity to take is one that itself could potentially skew and influence public opinion, and that would be an enormous temptation to the government, uh, to whoever was in power at the time, Democrats, Republicans, uh, conservatives, liberals, the Parti Quebecois, or whoever uh, you want to talk about. Uh, nonetheless, I do think this idea, if only because I came up with it, does deserve some more attention. Perhaps some of you will write about it in your own academic work, and if you can solve this problem of how to create the test in an unbiased way, please let me know. I'd be very interested in your solution. Uh, however, until we come up with that solution or we, until we come up with some other uh, miraculous way to increase political knowledge, uh, I instead suggest that uh, one possible way of mitigating the problem of political ignorance is to make more decisions by voting with our feet.
seat and fewer at the ballot box. What you have up on the screen is a paradigmatic example of voting with your feet. This is immigrants arriving in New York City in the late 19th century. They are voting with their feet against uh, various European governments and in favor of the U.S., which, despite its flaws, offer greater opportunities and less oppressive public policies in various ways uh, to these people. So one kind of voting with your feet uh, that I discuss in the book uh, is when we vote with our feet by choosing one jurisdiction over another, uh, Say in a federal system, we choose what town to live in or what state or province to live in, often based in part on what kind of policies they have and whether they serve our interests uh, well or not. But you can also vote with your feet in the market or through civil society, for instance, by choosing which university to attend, as all of you have chosen to attend McGill, uh, or you can choose which product to buy and so forth. Notice that in the private sector, often we can vote with our feet without ever actually physically going anywhere. For instance, just sitting at home, uh, I can call up a different cable company and get a subscription to a, uh, a different package from one that I have now. So what distinguishes voting with your feet from voting at the ballot box is not how much movement you make, uh, but rather whether you're making an individual choice that by itself is likely to be decisive or whether you're casting one vote out of many thousands uh, or many millions. Uh, now, why would voting with your feet be any better than voting at the ballot box from an informational point of view? After all, in both cases, you need to learn some information to make an informed choice. And in both cases, it's going to be costly to uh, spend time and effort learning information and processing it. Uh, so I suggest that voting with your feet has important informational advantages for a couple of reasons. One big one is precisely the very fact that your choice will make a difference. When you choose where to live or what product to buy, uh, you know that it'll make a difference, and therefore you spend more time acquiring information. If you're like most people, uh, you probably spent more time acquiring information the last time you bought a car or a television set than the last time you decided who to vote for in a national election. Now, is that because your TV is more important than who governs your country or because the television is more complex than the policy choices that you know, your political leaders make, I would suggest probably not. It's rather that when you bought the television set, you knew that that decision would actually make a difference, whereas when you voted in a national election, you knew that the chance it would make a difference was extraordinarily small. So therefore, quite understandably, you spent more time on the one decision uh, than you did on the other. Uh, this applies not just to your incentive to seek out information, but your incentive to do a good job of evaluating information that you have to try to resist your biases. It's certainly not the case that when people make decisions in the market or when people decide what jurisdiction to live in, they're completely unbiased or completely objective, but on average, they're more likely to be unbiased uh, than when they, or at least less biased than when they uh, vote at the ballot box. Think of the following social norms that we have, uh, at least in the English-speaking world, that you're not supposed to argue about politics in mixed company. If you come up to somebody who disagrees with you about political issues and you explain to them why they're wrong, uh, even if you have a devastating argument that completely refutes whatever it is that they believe and you present them with lots of new information that they never heard of before, they probably won't thank you for it. In fact, many of them will actually be very angry at you for showing them up and uh, making them look stupid, perhaps even in front of their friends. Uh, believe me, I know that they don't react very well. I know from painful personal experience that this is what is likely to happen. Uh, on the other hand, if you come up to somebody and you give them new information that might be relevant to a foot voting decision that they're going to make, uh, say, information about a better car, a better TV, or how living in another town might be, make them better off than where they live now, they won't necessarily be grateful, but generally speaking, they'll be more receptive to what you have to say than if you start criticizing their political views. Uh, and that's because while they might not necessarily be happy to hear that they're wrong about something or ignorant about something, they know the information will actually be useful or could be useful to a decision of theirs that is likely to actually make a difference. Uh, and this is not just 
theory or common sense as you like. There are lots and lots of good historical examples of uh, foot voters making well-informed decisions even under highly adverse conditions. One example that I discuss at some length in the book is the case of African Americans living in the segregated Jim Crow South in the late 19th and early 20th century. These people were highly oppressed by their state governments. Uh, many of them were, had very low levels of education or were even illiterate. And southern state governments even often deliberately tried to keep them from learning information about how things were better uh, in the North because northern states, while certainly not free of racism, uh, had less oppressive policies than the uh, South did. Nonetheless, despite these very severe obstacles, millions of African Americans during that period did in fact learn the conditions were better in the North, and also, by the way, better for them in some parts of the South as compared to others, and they did act on that information and make uh, appropriate migration decisions. Uh, obviously, uh, in the modern world, uh, we have much more information, most of us, than they did. We can acquire it more easily. And obviously, most of us have a higher level of education. So if foot voting can work well from an informational point of view, uh, even under highly adverse conditions, uh, it can also work under the much less adverse conditions that uh, many people face today. And there's actually uh, comparable evidence that we have today in the book, for instance, I discussed how uh, most of the public has very little understanding of, for instance, of Obamacare or of the uh, Medicare expansion passed by President Bush in 2003. In fact, 70% of the public has never even heard of that Medicare expansion at the time that it was passed, even though it was the biggest new government program in the United States in some 40 years. But when you look at people who had to make decisions as foot voters within that program, deciding which kind of insurance plan or which kind of drug benefit they would choose, uh, the data showed that some 80, 70 to 80% of those people or more made actually quite quite good decisions, even though, frankly, the plans in that program were poorly structured and difficult to understand. I'm certainly not trying to defend the policy that President Bush put forward in that instance, but people who had to deal with that policy as foot voters did a generally better job of informing themselves than people who had to deal with the exact same policy uh, as ballot box voters, though both sets of people faced significant obstacles in trying to understand uh, what was going on. Uh, I'm not, by the way, suggesting that foot voting solved all of the problems of the African Americans 100 years ago. Clearly not. Uh, clearly there was still enormous racism and hostility towards them, but through foot voting they at least did make themselves significantly less worse off than they would be before, and they made decisions under, ad under adverse conditions that were better informed than ballot box voters make today, or for that matter in that era, uh, even under much more favorable conditions. Uh, so, uh, obviously, there are potential downsides of foot voting, and there are various criticisms that have been made of the idea. In the book, I address three of the most important ones at some length. The most obvious one is moving costs. Although voting might not have good information incentives, at least it's cheap. In most cases, it doesn't take much time and effort to go to the ballot box. It does take time and effort to learn about what you're voting on, and most people don't do that, but actually going and voting is relatively cheap and easy. By contrast, moving from one state to another or even one city to another can be costly, and that's a real disadvantage of foot voting. I think this is a genuine problem, but it's not nearly as severe as may seem at first glance. Uh, in modern society, moving costs are often relatively low, and indeed they're low enough uh, that some 43% of Americans have made at least one interstate move in their lives, and some 63% uh, have at least made a move within a state. To the extent that moving costs are a problem, we can partially mitigate them by decentralizing functions of government to lower levels or even to the private sector. It's cheaper and easier to move from one town to another than one state to another. And if you're making a decision in the private sector, often you can vote with your feet without actually physically moving anywhere at all. So moving costs are a general, genuine issue, but we can set up foot voting in many cases in such a way uh, so as to uh, minimize the 
problem. Uh, a second uh, problem with foot voting that is raised, especially in the United States, for a reason I'm about to explain in a moment, this may be less relevant to Canada, uh, is the possibility of the oppression of minorities. Uh, if I had to name one thing that historically has given American federalism a bad name, it's the fact that state governments have often oppressed minority groups, most famously African Americans and others. So the concern is that if you decentralize political power, what that that will mean is that minorities will be oppressed by local tyranny of the majority, if you will, and while foot voting might benefit members of the majority, United States whites, uh, it will be harmful or at least certainly not beneficial uh, to members of these vulnerable minority groups. I think it's undeniable that there's some truth to the idea, at least in American history, that state and local governments have often oppressed minorities, but it doesn't necessarily follow that centralization uh, of political power is always what's best for those minorities. And the conventional wisdom about the history of American federalism, while certainly having an element of truth, is in many ways overblown. Uh, one way, thing that it often ignores is that the federal government in the United States also has a long history of oppressing minorities. Uh, for instance, before the Civil War, it often did a lot to promote slavery, much more to promote slavery than it ever did to undermine it. Uh, in the years after the Civil War, for many decades, the federal government itself perpetuated segregation in various ways. For instance, the District of Columbia, the one part of the United States that at that time was under complete federal government authority, was highly segregated, just as segregated uh, as the South was. The federal government also did such things as intern Japanese Americans in concentration camps during World War II and also oppress other minorities in other ways. So giving more powers to federal government isn't always and invariably better for minorities. Moreover, uh, at some points in American history, it is likely that uh, vulnerable minority groups would have been even worse off than they were had power been concentrated at the center. For example, when the United States was first established uh, in the 1770s and 80s, if there had been a unitary central policy on slavery, it probably would have meant universal slavery everywhere because at that time, uh, all but one or two states uh, still had slavery. So a unitary policy would probably have been universal slavery rather than universal freedom. Similarly, in the early 20th century, if we'd had a unitary policy on racial segregation, uh, we would likely have looked much closer to the Southern policy than to the Northern one because Southern whites were much more intent on promoting segregation than Northern whites on ending it or undermining it. Uh, so uh, finally, it's worth noting on this that minority groups throughout much of American history and also in other countries uh, have benefited tremendously from the ability to vote with their feet for jurisdictions that might have better policies for them. I mentioned one example of this earlier. Uh, another good example that's more recent is that of gays and lesbians who have been able to move to jurisdictions that are more tolerant uh, and more supportive of, uh, of them in various ways, including those that have permitted uh, same-sex marriage earlier than others. Uh, uh, so uh, it is not certainly my contention that centralization is always bad for minorities. There clearly are situations where it can benefit them. Uh, I'm just getting near the end, yeah. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, uh, it, I think the conventional wisdom on this uh, is somewhat overblown. Uh, I'm going to skip over for the moment the issue of the race to the bottom, though I'm happy to talk about it uh, if time permits. Uh, but I will note that the broader implication of uh, what I have to say in the book with respect to federalism uh, in, is that uh, if you accept my argument about the informational advantages of voting with your feet, uh, then it turns out that there are tremendous advantages to decentralizing political power and also to reducing the role of government relative to private sector. Both of those moves give people more opportunity to make decisions by voting with their feet uh, where they're better informed than when they vote at the ballot box. At the same time, however, it is certainly not my claim that this means we should have the maximum possible decentralization or the maximum possible limitation of government. 
Obviously, there are many other factors that should go into determining how centralized government should be uh, or uh, how limited it should be. Uh, political knowledge is just one of them. So uh, if you read this book and you agree with everything I say there, you won't necessarily be as much in favor of decentralization or as much in favor of limiting government as I might be, but you will probably be more in favor of it than you yourself would be otherwise because other things equal, this, prob this problem strengthens the case for limitation and for decentralization. Uh, in the last couple of minutes that I have, if I have a couple of minutes, I'd like to briefly note the implications uh, of political ignorance for judicial review. Uh, in the United States and other countries, the main objection has been raised against strong judicial review is the idea is that it's anti-democratic, that it undermines the ability of democracy or of the people to control government policy. Uh, legal scholars call this the counter-majoritarian difficulty. Once you realize the problem of political ignorance, it turns out that the counter-majoritarian difficulty is less of a problem than I think it is in two separate ways. One is that if many of the policies that judges might strike down are actually ones that the public is ignorant about, either doesn't know about or doesn't understand its effects, then the extent to which it's actually counter-majoritarian to strike them down is at least significantly diminished as compared to policies which really do reflect the public will in a meaningful way. Secondly, uh, it may be the case that judicial review can often actually strengthen public control of government policy and strengthen accountability, uh, what scholars call a representation reinforcing effect, and this too can happen in a couple of different ways. One is if through judicial review, uh, the judiciary takes certain issues off the political agenda entirely, such as, for instance, freedom of speech or religion or the like, uh, then that uh, enables people to make decisions on those issues through foot voting rather than ballot box voting uh, and thereby make them in a more informed way. Uh, and similarly, and if in a federal system the judiciary limits the powers of the central government, leaves more issues to regional or local governments, that too facilitates foot voting and facilitates better accountability uh, and more uh, informed decision making. Now, as with decentralization and limitation of government. I'm not suggesting that this means that we should just have the maximum possible judicial review or that judges should be able to strike down whatever policies they want. All I'm suggesting is that other things equal. This problem diminishes the counter-majoritarian difficulty and strengthens the case uh, for strong judicial review. So on that note, I think the time has expired, uh, but I very much look forward to your questions. Thank you so much for having me. Two things about the question and answer time. One is when you ask a question, please turn on the microphone in front of you and then turn it off when you're done. The other is that it is our rule here to reserve the first question for a member of the Research Group on Constitutional Studies Student Fellowship. So to one of the student fellows, the floor is open. Hi. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It was compelling, if a bit disheartening. <laughs> um, I guess my question is mostly about voting with your feet. It seems like the focus of that is to minimize kind of your own personal harm from living in a specific location, or from having a lack of specific products. Uh, do you think the focus of politics should go beyond simply this individual perspective, though, on making yourself better off and rather trying to use uh, more or to try to realize more collective goals beyond just kind of assuaging personal difficulty? Yeah, so that's a good question. Let me answer in a couple of different ways. First of all, it is in fact my belief, as I mentioned briefly in the book, that when people vote at the ballot box, because it affects other people as well as themselves, uh, they should take uh, the broader public interest into account and not just their own. It is true that when people move, uh, often they only take into account their interests or that of their families, uh, but often precisely by doing that they actually benefit the public interest as well because they incentivize uh, state and local governments uh, to uh, adopt good policies that will attract migrants in various ways. Uh, so uh, often the public interest and their self-interest are actually aligned in foot voting in a way that in ballot box voting uh, there's less of an alignment because of the incentive to remain uh, ignorant. In addition, uh, I also talk in the book actually about organized group migration. Groups can also vote with their feet. Uh, many, for instance, religious groups uh, or other kinds of groups moved collectively 
from Europe to the United States or from one part of the United States to others. The most famous example is the Mormons and their effort to establish the state of Utah or other uh, similar examples, I think also in Canadian history, I'm not as uh, familiar with those. Uh, so there are cases where one can argue that people's individual self-interest in migrating will have bad collective effects. This is actually the race to bottom argument that I didn't have time for in my presentation, but if people are interested, I can talk about it now, or uh, you can read about it in the book uh, if you prefer. There is a discussion of it. It's not that my argument is not that these kinds of problems never happen, but that they happen much less often than uh, advocates of this theory claim that they do. Uh, so we can have some limitations on state and local authority to diminish the races to the bottom that do exist, but still leave a lot of uh, issues to foot voting. I'm really glad that you uh, just uh, wanted to bring up the um, Ish, the topic of group migration. I was one, I was going to ask you about the Free State Project in New Hampshire. <laughs> there is a objective of twenty thousand people moving there, and they already have fifteen thousand people. So, any thoughts on that project? Sure. So, uh, I'm impressed that people in Canada know about this. But uh, uh, for those of you who may not know, the Free State Project is a project by a group of uh, libertarians in the United States. Uh, to collectively get together and commit to moving to one state, in this case the state of New Hampshire, which actually already is the most libertarian state in the U.S. And their idea is that if enough of them move there, uh, because it's a relatively small state, they can actually have a significant collective effect on the state's politics. I must admit, when I first heard about this project, the founder of it is a political scientist and acquaintance of mine, he, Jason Sorens. I think he's at, is he at SUNY Buffalo, is that right? He's moved to Dartmouth. Cool. Okay. My wife's alma mater. Okay. Uh, so I didn't know that. He said, so that's right. He, Dartmouth is in New Hampshire, so it makes sense that he would move there. Anyways, the idea is to engage in a group migration so that they would be able to, in fact, bend the state's politics uh, to their purposes. I must admit that when I, when I first heard about this idea from uh, Jason Sorens 12 or 15 years ago, I was quite skeptical that either A, they would get the number of people together that they wanted to get, or B, that they would have a big effect. Clearly, they have gotten together, if not the 20,000 people, and at least more people than I thought they would. How big of an effect that they will have on New Hampshire's politics, I think, remains to be seen. They've already had some effect at the margin, but uh, it's hard to say whether the effect will be anything more than making a state which is already the most libertarian state in the United States somewhat more libertarian at the margin. If you are a libertarian, then that would still a good effect, but it's not the same thing as uh, sort of a huge world-changing effect. It's different from the Utah case that I mentioned earlier where the Mormons moved to a place where there were very few people to begin with, or at least very few people that the U.S. government recognized as having any right to vote in elections. There were only Native Americans at that time and uh, a relatively small number. So uh, in New Hampshire, there actually already are several million people. They do have the right to vote. Uh, and whether the Free State Project people will be able to make a decisive major impact in the state politics, I think, remains to be seen. But it is a good example of a deliberate effort at group migration uh, as opposed to purely individual migration or family-based. Thank you. Um, I mean this to sort of follow on the tail of the first question. Can you speak to the concern that foot voting is only viable on a very extreme margin? Because it seems that in the same way people aren't rationally driven to be politically informed, they won't be rationally driven to give primacy to political concerns in, say, making a decision about where to live or which market goods to buy? Yeah, so uh, I'm not claiming that they necessarily will or do give primacy to political concerns. Uh, in reality, much of the time, the concerns are things like uh, where will I get a better job, where will be a nicer place to live, uh, say where the price of real estate or housing is, is good. But those very things, jobs, housing, uh, quality of public service and the like are actually affected by public policy. So for instance, one reason why many Americans are moving from, from New York to Texas uh, in recent years is because New York, through its zoning regulation, at least in New York City and other big cities, uh, has artificially increased the price of real estate so as to price out much of the poor and the middle class almost entirely from the real estate market, whereas Texas, while it may have other flaws, uh, uh, makes, uh, it makes it relatively easy to build new 
housing uh, for the poor and the middle class. Uh, so many of the people who are making this move don't think of themselves as saying, well, I feel the Texas is zoning policies are better in New York's, but nonetheless, those policies are dictating their migration patterns, and there are many other similar examples there. Now, what you said about the large margin, that does relate to the issue that I pointed out about moving costs, that if moving costs are significant, people will only move if there's a very significant advantage in doing so. I, I think that's a, a genuine issue, but that's why, where possible, we want to decentralize political power to lower levels so that moving costs are less. To take one example, uh, I believe that one of the reasons why California is one of the most dysfunctional states in the United States politically over the last couple decades is uh, that it's very large and, as a result, less subject to foot voting pressure than other smaller states would be. Uh, if I had my way, we should break up California and also Texas and other large states. Possibly one can make similar arguments about larger Canadian provinces like Ontario or, dare I say it, perhaps even Quebec. There could be perhaps two French-speaking provinces rather than, uh, than what I know. Also, there's already New Brunswick, so maybe three. Um. Hi. Hi. Oh, sorry, I, I had trouble figuring out where, where, where you're sitting. That's okay. Um, so I have a question about whether um, there's, what, like when judicial review versus foot voting is most appropriate for uh, resolving a certain consequence of political ignorance. Um, so uh, would you say that judicial review is more appropriate when the consequence affects fundamental rights, for example, where you might say foot voting is not the appropriate um, solution, right? So take the case of Quebec, where sure. we have a proposed Charter of Quebec values that might, in fact, lead to foot voting by, you know, Muslims, Jews, and Sikhs uh, leaving sure. the province for the, because of the restrictions on religious dress. Uh, but you might want to say, well, that's not the appropriate uh, solution because really it should be judicial review that guarantees certain basic rights so that people don't have to move for those reasons. And I'm wondering whether you so yeah. If that's how you're trying to think about the appropriateness of the different... Yeah, yeah. So that's a good question. I think in that case and in probably a lot of others involving uh, judicial review, especially with respect to important rights, there's more going on here than foot voting versus ballot box voting. That's why I said that this is not a complete theory of judicial review. This is just an important consideration you should take account of, but neither is foot voting irrelevant to that, in that you might at the very least say that other things equal, often it might be better if a decision about important freedoms are decided at a more local level rather than a national level because if you get it wrong, at least you have the opportunity to vote with your feet, whereas if the nation as a whole is oppressing Sikhs or Jews or Muslims or what have you, then they might not be able to escape it at all except by leaving the country. But you might also say that for many such decisions where possible, it's better to make it at a level lower even than the provincial or local level. Uh, why not simply do, as many Western democracies do, why not actually let individuals or families decide what religious beliefs they're going to practice, whether they're going to wear distinctive religious clothing, what languages they will speak at home, and so forth, as opposed to having any level of government decide it. And that gives even more opportunity for foot voting. If uh, I don't like the church or the mosque, or uh, for instance, that my parents or other family members attend, I can choose to attend a different one or not attend at all, uh, and so forth. Uh, I'm not claiming that this can solve all problems of this kind, but uh, in some cases, we we actually do want to limit the powers of provincial or local governments so that we can engage in foot voting at an even lower level than that and therefore actually have more options and fewer moving costs. Uh, thanks very much. I just, right here. Oh, sorry. Uh, one quick question. I'm interested in your objections to the education solution. And um, if we could kickstart reform relatively easily, do you think education might actually be a solution? Because you seem to qu quite quickly dismiss that, not only in terms of the actual sure. um, kickstarting, but also just itself. So I was wondering if, if we could get past that incentive problem at the very beginning, do you think it might actually be a solution? So I think it would help. Uh, obviously, the way you structure a question almost by definition, if we can do it easily, then of course we should do it because more knowledge would be better than less, even if it wasn't as much knowledge as we would ideally want to have. Uh, we would still have the problem that even a much better education system with respect to political issues uh, might not get us to the point where people can follow 
all of the different issues that the modern state engages with, uh, but the best should not be the enemy of the good. So if we could get around these incentive problems, we certainly should. However, it's striking that over many decades, uh, we haven't been very successful in doing it, either United States or there's less evidence on the effects in other countries, but such evidence as I've seen uh, you know, is not very optimistic, uh, in, not because it's technologically or educationally unfeasible to educate people in basic political knowledge, I think this is stuff most people can learn, uh, but rather because the incentives of the political system are not aligned with what we want to do, and this is a pretty fundamental problem in public education. It's not easy to get around. They don't rule out that somebody will come up with a solution to the problem. Uh, you know, if, if you write a book or an article or somebody else does, which shows how to get around this problem, I'm, I'm all ears or all eyes, depending on the situation. But uh, it's actually a pretty difficult problem. Uh, hello, Professor. Over here. Um, incentives aside, do you think that a democratic society could require its, its, its citizens to earn the right to vote in the same manner that they earn their driver's license? Yeah, so uh, Brian Kaplan actually makes this analogy in his book about political ignorance, The Myth of a Rational Voter, where he says, well, uh, ba bad voting, he says, is like bad driving. It can be harmful to people other than the driver or the voter himself. So if we have a license to drive, why not a license to vote? Uh, so obviously this goes fundamentally against modern notions of democratic equality where we say, well, every citizen or at least every adult should be able to vote. Uh, but I wouldn't reject it on principle uh, as be in, for a couple reasons. One, the one I already gave, that voting does uh, impact other people, not just yourself. Uh, the other is we actually already in modern liberal democracies have many restrictions on the franchise, which are in part based on knowledge. For instance, why don't we let children vote? It's certainly not because they aren't affected by government policy or not because they aren't citizens, because we think they're too ignorant to vote. Do I actually think there's a case for letting more knowledgeable children allow to have the franchise, but most people say anybody below the age of 18, we can't really trust them to vote, or below the age of 16 or 17 in some countries. So if we exclude children based on ignorance, why not exclude adults as well? As a matter of principle, I don't necessarily object to it, but there's a major problem in practice, which I discuss in the book, and that is, uh, as it's just before, can we trust the government to come up with a necessary knowledge test? Uh, there's a long history of literacy tests, for example, being used to exclude African Americans from voting in the United States, even if you posit a society which is less racist than the United States was a century ago, there would still be tremendous incentives for the government to construct the test in such a way, not necessarily to ex exclude people based on race, but to exclude its political opponents, for example, uh, whether they're of the same race or not. Uh, thanks. I had a question, just to follow up on the education question. Um, so I thought your second point about the problem of if we carry on 50, 60 years in the future, these people will still be voting, but with um, much, you know, much the same knowledge they had before, which wouldn't be very useful, on, an, useful. on an ongoing basis. Um, I, I thought this seems to treat education perhaps as content rather than sort of context-based. So in teaching people how to do things rather than teaching them about something in particular. And if you look at certain subjects, say English literature, a lot of people wouldn't necessarily go on to become poets or writers, but they would have a better understanding of the, the, uh, the syntax and semantics in, in, in order to actually use this in everyday life. Do you think that if we had more of a focus on citizenship education, for example, that would give us the tools with which to interpret something like C-SPAN, for example? Sure. It would give us some of the tools, uh, potentially, if we did it right. The problem is, would we, in fact, watch C-SPAN and use the tools? So with English literature, uh, there are some people who take English, if an English literature course is well-structured, the people who take the course will definitely uh, have better tools for reading other classic works of literature in the future. For instance, because I took a course about Shakespeare, I can now better read other Shakespeare plays other than the ones that I read in the course. However, people who don't like Shakespeare are less interested than I am, in fact, do not go on to read much Shakespeare after they leave college or high school. Uh, so even though they have the ability to do it, they don't exercise it. And the same thing is also true of political knowledge. You could potentially give people a grounding that then they could potentially build on, but the problem is will they in fact build on it? And then based on what we know about uh, people's levels of interest in politics and how much time they're willing to devote to acquiring political information. I'm not optimistic on that score. 
Uh, but you're right, for the person who's highly interested in politics, a good course on civics can, you know, can be very useful to them and then later uh, pursuing that interest just as for a person who likes classic literature, uh, a course on Shakespeare or other classic literature could then help them be a better reader of it uh, in the future. Sadly, those people are only a small proportion of the population uh, in, most, uh, in most countries, I think. Uh, can you speak, uh, in some countries like Australia, they have, uh, sorry, a bit to the right. Oh, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry. It's, because of the echo, it's hard for me to hear where the sound is coming from, or maybe this is my hearing just declining because of senility, but please go ahead. Uh, some countries like Australia have uh, compulsory voting for their uh, citizens. Uh, do you see that having any kind of effect on what you've talked about, or do you see that kind of being lost anyways? Uh, yeah. yeah, I think that makes the problem worse, actually, because although... Uh, one thing that is difficult to do, uh, given existing data, is compare the knowledge levels of voters with those of non-voters. Uh, there are surveys where we ask people whether they voted or not. However, what you find is not only that many people lie about whether they voted or not, but also the people most likely to lie if they hadn't voted are actually those most interested in politics know the most. Uh, so despite that problem in the data deal, it is very likely that people who vote do have at least somewhat higher levels of political knowledge than those that don't. So if you force everybody to vote, uh, as Australia does in a few other countries, you end up with uh, a more ignorant electorate than you would have otherwise. And you might say, well, Australia is actually a fairly well-governed country compared to others. So it can't be that bad. But if you look more broadly at the nations that have compulsory voting, uh, Australia is just one of them, and quite a few of the others actually are not ones that have very good governments. Argentina is on that list. Egypt is on that list, a number of other countries. It is not my view that compulsory voting makes the problem enormously worse than it would be otherwise. But I think it does make it modestly worse at the least. And I think it's also an infringement on individual freedom. So uh, I think we should worry more about uh, whether the people who go to the polls know what they're voting about and understand it than about uh, getting them to go to polls in the first place. And unfortunately, in much of public discourse, at least in the United States, possibly in Canada as well, I'm, not, I'm less certain about Canada, we have a lot of people talking about we need to get more people to the polls uh, and relatively few people talking about whether the people who go to the polls actually understand what they're voting on. Before we run out of time, I'd like to take a turn. <laughs> I should, I'm, I'm very scared. <laughs> <laughs> I worry that in your final reformist steps, your solution steps, there's a certain amount of assume a can opener going on. <laughs> um, the choice of a rule about federalism or the choice of laws governing decentralization or the choice of how much of a of an economy should be governed by the government and how much should be governed by the market. Broadly speaking, how much of the world is shaped at the ballot box and how much is shaped by foot voting. Those are choices that have to emerge from the same political system that you've been talking about all along. Whether this is directly so because you vote for a political party that says it will shrink the role of government in the economy, or at a couple of degrees of remove because you vote for the legislators who enact constitutional amendments that then in turn give us rules governing federalism. If we had voters who were smart enough to choose good federalism rules and choose good constitutional political economy rules as you understand those things, wouldn't we have voters who were smart enough to make direct decisions yeah. at the ballot box so I, so I think knowledgeable enough and smart enough are actually not quite the same things. But I take your point. More broadly, a question I often get is, if you're right in your diagnosis of this problem, why do you even bother to write this book, right? Because uh, the voters are actually ignorant. They will probably ignore this book just like they ignore a lot of other evidence out there. So uh, I, I can say, well, maybe the purpose of the book is to get me tenure, but I already had tenure when I wrote it, so I can't even claim that's offense. So what's the point, right? And uh, it's not an easy question, uh, but I did actually get it often enough that I decided to add a section to the conclusion of the book uh, which discusses this. Uh, and here's my answer. Uh, part of the answer is that 
Uh, there are actually people who have influence on public policy through mechanisms other than voting, uh, political elites, better informed people, activists and others, and I hope at least at the margin to persuade some of them that decentralizing and limiting government is a good way to go, and, or at the very least that political ignorance is a serious problem that they need to pay more attention to. Secondly, uh, within the general public, uh, and we have particularly have survey data on this in the U.S., but there's some from other countries as well, they know very little about government and public policy, but they also have, according to many surveys, a significant distrust of government and fear of politicians. For instance, in the United States, uh, routinely politicians come at the very top of the list of most distrusted professions, even more so than lawyers and used car salesmen. People don't trust uh, politicians. So uh, it's not impossible to uh, channel that distrust into support for limitation and decentralization of government as opposed to where it often goes uh, currently, which is saying, well, if only we elected the right person, a uniter rather than a divider, as President Bush said he would be, or a uh, person who will bring us change we can believe in, as President Obama said. I'm sure there are similar political slogans in Canada and other countries. Uh, I think it's not likely that we can persuade the average voter to double or triple or quadruple the amount of time he or she devotes to acquiring political information, but it's not impossible over time that we can persuade more voters to uh, recognize, A, that they know relatively little about politics, and B, a good way to combat that over time unless they can envision spending vastly more time acquiring political information. A good way to combat that might be to uh, support policies that reduce uh, the political realm and promote promote uh, political decentralization. Uh, and on some issues, we actually have seen shifts like this over time. For instance, uh, until 100 to 200 years ago, the overwhelming majority of people in the Western world thought, of course, government should closely regulate religion. What's more important than regulating sort of the fundamental spiritual and moral questions in people, people's lives? But over time, people have gotten a sense that religion is not the kind of things that government manages well. And so public opinion has very slowly, much more and it should have in part because of ignorance, but has over time moved to the point not that people know a lot about the regulation of religion, but that they realize that precisely that they, because they don't know very much about it that government shouldn't regulate or at least not regulate it very much. And I hope more issues can be gotten into that category. Uh, is this likely to happen on a large scale anytime soon? Probably not, but we can move incrementally uh, in that direction. Moreover, as I note uh, in my book, on the conclusion, some Western nations, and by the way, Canada is a notable example, uh, actually have achieved large reductions in the size, scope, and complexity of their public sector uh, over the last uh, 20 to 30 years. Uh, Canada's public sector actually now is smaller than that in the United States. That is partly because the United States one has grown over the last 10 years, but partly because Canada shrank enormously in the 90s and early 2000s. So what Canada has been able to do is something uh, other countries that we saw in them can do as well. Uh, I don't imagine that uh, we're going to comprehensively solve this problem anytime soon, uh, but I do think significant incremental improvements can be made in a direction of greater decentralization and limitation. All right. With that, we are... Out of time, I'd ask that uh, you remember that you're invited to join us for the next lecture on January 30th, Scott Lemieux on Judicial Supremacy. Immediately following, you are invited to join us for a reception in the area right outside this room. And please join me in thanking Ilya Soman. I also have these exciting flyers about the book, if any of you uh, want to take them. Sadly, only in English, not in French, but, uh, but wait, I do have them. <laughs>